everybody is silence your cell phones um, so as not to disrupt the event. And when we get to the audience Q&A portion, there's a microphone to your right. It's kind of hidden behind the pillar, but it's there. If you can please line up there and speak into it clearly, we are uh, filming today's event. Um, and then when we get to the signing, you're gonna line up there as well. And the signing line, she'll be signing right here at this table. If you haven't already purchased a book, there are plenty back at the registers. Um, and then once everything is complete, if you could fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy, that'd be fantastic. So without further ado, we are so excited to be here to celebrate uh, Rachel L. Swarns for the 272, the families who were enslaved and sold to build the American Catholic Church. In 1838, a group of America's most prominent Catholic priests sold 272 enslaved people to save their largest mission project, which is now Georgetown University. In this groundbreaking account, Professor Swarns follows one family through nearly two centuries of indentured servitude and enslavement to uncover the harrowing origin story of the Catholic Church in the United States. Rachel L. Swarns is a journalist, author, and associate professor of journalism at New York University who writes about race and race relations as a contributing writer for the New York Times. Her articles about Georgetown University's roots in slavery touched off a national conversation about America's universities and their ties to this painful period in history. Her work has been recognized and supported by the National Endowment for Humanities, the Ford, or Ford Foundation, the Leon Levy Center for Biography, the Biographers International Organization, among others. As a correspondent for the Times, Swarns reported from Russia, Cuba, Guatemala, and Southern Africa, and covered immigration and presidential politics and Michelle Obama and her role in the Obama White House. She is the author of American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, and the co-author of Unseen, Unpublished Black History from the New York Times Photo Archives. Swarns will be joined in conversation today with Michelle Martin, the host of Morning Edition. Previously, she was the weekend host of All Things Considered and host of the Consider This Saturday podcast, where she drew on her deep reporting and interviewing experience to dig into the week's news. She has spent more than 25 years as a journalist and has been honored by numerous organizations. And so now please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Rachel L. Swarns and Michelle Martin. Thank you. Friendly Amendment, a host of Morning Edition. There are four of us. Do not get me in trouble. I want to go back and mark my Monday. Welcome. And welcome home. Thank neighbor. you. It's nice neighbor. to have you back in, uh, back in DC. Um, quite a journey. You know, when I, well, how many of you read her original New York Times piece in 2016? I know it's been a while. Do you remember? Okay. So do you ever wonder when somebody writes, what's particularly a deeply reported article and then a book comes out if there's more to say do you ever like mm, is there really more to say <laughs> i can assert that there is um and i was wondering why you understood or when you understood that there was so much more to say what was it after the first piece which was so impactful and so deeply reported and so shocking to some um that made you understand that there was much more to say um well, it's so cool to be sitting alongside you <laughs> and to see you after so many years. Um, so I think it might be useful to talk a little bit about how I even came to this story. And um, it started in 2015. Uh, students were protesting um, at Georgetown. Um, they were concerned about um, two buildings that carried the names of two of the priests who happened to be early presidents who um, had orchestrated this sale. Um, and um, the administration changed the names. The administration had been considering changing the names even before that. Um, but the, um, the protest caught the eye of a Georgetown alum, um, a CEO of a tech company in Cambridge, who said, okay, protest uh, about the buildings, about this history, change the names. Um, but the 272, like what happened to them? 
Um, and so he reached out to a faculty member at Georgetown. As I mentioned, Georgetown had already been looking into this and trying to think about its own history in slavery and how to wrestle with it. And he said, okay, well, what happened to their descendants? And he was told they all died. <laughs> and he said, they all died? Like nearly 300 people, they all died? No descendants? Um, and that seemed implausible to him. Um, there were certainly other people in the working group at Georgetown who thought there were descendants, um, but this guy said there weren't. And so um, this guy, Richard Cellini, um, said to himself, that makes absolutely no sense. Um, and Richard um, was someone, he's a white guy, CEO of a tech company, a Republican guy who had not been involved in racial justice issues um, in any way before, but he loved Georgetown. And he said, you know, like, I think we kind of owe, you know, something to these people. We, the school's existence um, is connected to these people. And so he hired a team of genealogists who started digging and trying to find descendants. And then he reached out to a colleague of mine um, at the Times, who was on the business side, business reporter rather, and said, hey, you know, I think I've, I've got an exclusive for the Times about a slave sale in the 1830s that benefited Georgetown. And she was kind of like, okay, um, interesting. Is that even a story? <laughs> um, and so it is my great, great fortune that she didn't just delete the email. I mean, you have to remember, this was before the 1619 Project. You know, this kind of reporting wasn't, ta Coates had done his case for reparations, but it wasn't the kind of reporting that we typically do. But she remembered that there was someone on the staff who had, might have a sense of this. And she remembered the book I had done about Michelle Obama's ancestors, tracing her enslaved ancestors back to the 1800s. So she forwarded the email to me. And I knew, immediately I knew, it was a story. Um, my reporting about Michelle Obama's um, ancestors had allowed me to explore how slavery shaped American families. And I thought that this would be the next step to look at how slavery shaped um, one of our elite institutions. Um, so, but what I didn't know was, you know, who, who were the 272? And that's, that's what I needed to find out, what I wanted to find out. Can I just tell you, I, 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 I was so moved by every aspect of that story, which is I didn't understand the backstory until I read the book. That think about this, let's just, can we just marinate in that for a minute? This white guy who had not thought very much about slavery or enslavement, didn't have any connection to it, and understands that an institution that he cares deeply about is deeply enmeshed in it, and he digs into his pocket, does some work, and then reaches out to you, and your colleague reaches it's, out to you, and there we have it. And, and I just it. think that, you know, it, it's, first of all, that's reporting 101, folks, for those of you who, <laughs> it really, this is why I always tell my interns, answer the mail, please. Like, <laughs> please do answer the mail. Please go to the mail room. Please do read your it's email. True. Please do read your email. And this, I would say he asked, like, a very fundamental question, which was just, who were right. they, and what were their names, you know? This is the quote from the book. You said, this is not a disembodied group of people who are nameless and faceless. These are real people with real names and real descendants. And that's what, that was his quote. That's what he, that's what he said. That's what he felt. And in, that's fact, in fact, let us just ask if there are any among us today who are directly connected to this story, will you show yourself? So can the descendants, yeah, can you stand? Can we welcome you and honor you? Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. What did you, she just said, say what you just said. I said, we're still here. My family's still in Southern Maryland, the St. Mary's County. Right. Yeah. And we are glad you're still here. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for allowing your story to rise. Your article focused on Georgetown. In the book, it focuses on the bigger story of the role of slavery in the building of the American Catholic Church. As briefly as you can, what was it? Why was it so important? So, you know, I started, again, by looking at um, this sale. And I think um, it would be helpful to tell just a quick story that will make you understand 
how I got from the sale to the larger picture. Um, and to do that, I just want to tell a story, which I, I tell a lot, but I think as a journalist, um, I'm not a historian. Um, I often think about um, when you're writing about slavery, being aware that um, there are a lot of folks who are gonna say, oh, nope, no thank you, you know, turn the page, turn your head. And so how do you bring that story to people? How do you get people to hear? And the way I feel is the best way to get people to hear is to tell a story that's compelling, to introduce families that um, people might wanna read about. So when I talk about the 272 and how I got to Georgetown and then the Catholic Church, I like to bring people back to November of 1838 to give you a sense of what it was like for these people. And um, you know, in 1838, these folks were brought um, from Southern Maryland um, to Alexandria, Virginia. And if you had been there, you would have seen them. Scores of people being loaded onto a ship, forcibly loaded, elderly people, parents, children, babies. Um, witnesses describe people falling to their knees, weeping, begging for mercy. And these were people who were being torn from all the people they loved and the world that they knew and being shipped you know, down south. Um, they were owned by the nation's most powerful Jesuit priests, as you heard before, um, who happened to be among the largest slaveholders in Maryland. And they were selling these folks when times got hard, as people did, because they were their most prized assets and they wanted to save the school. And as I started digging and realizing, okay, wow, hey, I happen to be black and Catholic, had no idea that priests were involved in the slave trade, no idea that um, slavery helped um, to save you know, this institution, I started looking at the priests um, and looking at this history. And what I learned was it wasn't just Georgetown. The Jesuits built the early Catholic Church first in the British colony and then in early America. Um, and these priests who relied on slave labor and slave sales built you know, the first archdiocese, uh, the first cathedral, early convents, um, priests who operated plantations and sold people um, built the first Catholic seminary. So the underpinnings of the church were built by priests who were deeply, deeply involved in slavery. You write in the book, without the enslaved, the Catholic Church in the United States as we know it today would not exist. That's right. You know, one of the things that also struck me about the book is that you describe how oppression led to oppression, the inter how interweaved the various forms of oppression have been, and I found that very very interesting and, of course, upsetting. But could you talk a little bit about the Catholic Church and its attitude toward first indigenous people and how the attitude toward indigenous people um, and a kind of a, a, a transformation of its attitude toward indigenous people kind of led to its acceptance of the enslavement of people of African descent, which I found really fascinating. One of the things that's really fascinating about um, the Catholic Church, and, and it's, we should be very clear that it's not just the Catholic Church, right? It's Protestant churches too. Um, uh, you know, it's slavery's foundational uh, for a lot of things. Um, but the Catholic priests, unlike, you know, there were white people who viewed um, black people as brutes, animals, purely. Um, Catholics said, okay, no, we think they have souls and we want to nurture their souls, but we're, we're okay about enslaving them and selling their bodies. And people say, how is that possible? And what did Rome have to say? And that's what uh, Michelle is getting at. And it's interesting, slavery is an ancient practice, as we know. Um, it's in the Bible, the Jesuits often pointed to it, St. Paul talking about the responsibilities of slaves and masters. Um, when Europeans went into Africa and then into the Americas, they enslaved indigenous people initially. And there were protests by priests um, and Rome said, okay, we won't do that. But about, but there was still this insatiable need for labor. And so Africans filled that gap. And the church, Rome, remained silent about 
um, Africans too. And if you also want to look at, you know, kind of oppression leading to oppression, you know, the priests who came to Maryland um, came from England where they were persecuted. Catholics were persecuted. And Maryland was a refuge um, for, for Catholics. Um, but in trying to um, embed themselves um, and to be recognized as establishment society, um, slavery was part of establishment society. That's, that's what it was, and, and they became part of that. It's important to know, though, that there were always voices who raised questions. It, the priests, there were priests all along the way who had concerns about it. And also, one of the other things that I found fascinating about the book is how, at times when Catholics were persecuted, well, not so, well, persecuted, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but marginalized yes. within the politics of Maryland, they turned to, because Protestants wouldn't work for them, once again, they turned to enslaved Africans in order to save their, their properties and their, their kind of livelihoods. And I, I, you, you share that you are also, you identify as Catholic um, from birth, I assume? Yeah. Cradle Catholic. So um, do, you, do you mind if I ask how this recording, how did it influence your kind of faith walk? Did yeah. You, did it challenge your faith walk in any way? So, you know, I think it's interesting. I was doing this work. I'm Catholic. I'm a practicing Catholic. Um, and, you know, I'm going through these records. Um, and some of these records are, um, I've been doing this kind of research for a long time, but, you know, bracing records. Um, getting used to um, seeing, um, if, you're, if you're writing about enslaved people, um, you are writing about um, people who are viewed as property, so that's what you're looking for. You're looking for tax records. You're you're looking for property records. You're, you see these estate records that list, you know, the coffee tables, um, the tablecloths, the pigs, the dishes, and the list of the human beings. So that's sobering. And then I'm going to mass, right? <laughs> so, um, but you know, I think what has been interesting to me is. Um, the families themselves and the experience of the families themselves. Um, I tell the story of one family in particular, um, the Mahoney family, and, um, and the matriarch of that family, a woman by the name of Ann Joyce, arrives in the <coughs> 1600s, not just a few decades after the first um, priests arrive. And she's a free person. She's an indentured servant who's Freedom is stolen. She's forced into slavery by um, Catholic gentry. Um, but she holds on to the one thing that she has, which is her story. And she tells anyone who will listen that she should have been free and that her, her liberty was stolen. And she tells her children that, her grandchildren that. That story is passed on. People in her family, her descendants, resist. Some of them are. One of the two of them kill an overseer and are executed. Um, they go to court. They sue the Jesuits. Um, some of them win their freedom that way. Some of them don't. Harry Mahoney saves the church's wealth in the War of 1812, um, and and garners a pledge from the Jesuits that his he neither he nor his family will ever be sold, and that's a pledge that's broken in 1838. So. At times, the priests required um, black people um, to go to mass, um, to participate in the sacraments. Um, there were penalties for not doing that. Um, there is an instance where um, of two families, um, a priest ha decided that two families who had engaged in infidelity should be punished. He sold their children. Um, so after the Civil War, what did families do? You can ask, you know, would you stay Catholic after your, your, the priests had split up your family and <laughs> sold folks? Um, interestingly, you know, people, a number of people stayed, a number of people left, thousands left, because the church remained segregated afterwards. But members of this Mahoney family, many of them stayed. Not only did they stay, um, but they became lay leaders, some of them became religious leaders, and they worked to make the church true to its ideals of being a, a universal church. They set up black parishes. 
Um, two joined, um, became nuns, and ran schools for black children. Um, some of their descendants are Catholic to this day, and those records, actually, those sacramental records, have been really important um, to genealogists and, and to myself in terms of tracking these families. And, um, you know, and, and these descendants, who are among us now, um, many of them still Catholic, have been in the forefront of pressing the church and Georgetown to recognize this history. So I look at those folks, and in a crazy way, you know, I find some inspiration there. I see folks who said to themselves, this church does not belong to the sinful men who are in it. Um, this church, they don't control God, they don't control, you know, the Son, the Holy Spirit, none of that. Um, and, and it was their church, and they decided to make it that way. And to me, that inspires me, so I'm still going. I want to remind you that this is a, a conversation that we can all participate in. Um, there's only, sadly, there's one mic there, and I hate to make this a fitness contest, but um, my recommendation would be that we're going to turn to questions from you in, in just a minute or two. So if you have one, a, a thought you want to share, um, if you would perhaps begin making your way uh, to the microphone. And um, what was, you mentioned that you're not a, an historian, but you know, historians and journalists are in, basically in conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask, um, you know, we call it the first draft of history and yes. you know, all that. I don't, I don't know what the appropriate digital term would be. <laughs> the first email of history, I'm not sure what the right, is that even a <laughs> the first, no, 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 I'm not even using that word. Um, but what was the most, I don't know, As a, this wasn't really how you got started in journalism, right? You get started in journalism to kind of chronicle what's around you right now. Right. Not what happened 300 and 400 years right. ago. So I was just interested in whether you, was there any part of yourself that you had to, to sort of transform in order to do this work? Or you had to train your practice in some way? Or? There was a lot of learning involved. I realized that you know there was so much about American history, um, even as a reasonably educated person, that I just didn't know. Um, I've always been a records person. I covered courts early in my career, um, local courts and federal courts. Um, so I've always been a records person um, as a journalist. So records have been like kind of important to me and interesting to me. So learning, I had to learn a whole swath of, of records, um, but I, I think I've also been someone who always loved a good mystery, and the hunt for me is really, really interesting. And it was really when um, I got started on the article that led me to the book about Michelle Obama, um, I was searching for her great-great-grandfather um, who was born into slavery and was biracial, and I had gone to a cemetery, and I was amazed I could go to the archives and find where he was buried, the plot, you know, the number, who was next to him. I thought, you know, I, I had everything, I had it all together. And then I got to this cemetery, and it was in Birmingham, this old, neglected African-American cemetery, uh, with the grass up to my knees and the tombstones toppled, and, and many of you may know that even the dead were segregated, right, back in the day in the South. So I spent an entire day there, completely unsuccessful. <laughs> Uh, never found his tombstone, um, but there was something about that, um, just something about that 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 grabbed me, and I thought, you know, actually there is like nothing I'd rather be doing than this. And I came home to my husband. I said, "Good Lord, I don't know what happened. Something happened to me out there. Like maybe I need to get another degree." He's like, "Maybe not that, um, <laughs> <laughs> not that." And then. <laughs> I wrote Did this you story. Of two kids who <laughs> right, a mortgage. Like, right. He's like, "What Just are you doing?" Mentioning <laughs> it. <laughs> um, but um, you know, when a publisher approached me after that story ran, um, you know, he said, "Okay, that's the thing." And so that's that's what, it was just kind of this I don't know this weird thing that just kind of got me. I, I joke it's my midlife crisis about the 19th century, and um, I don't know. Yeah. Let's go to your conversation, your questions, thoughts now, and please join us. And you know, we know you know who we are, so we would love to know who you are. If that's okay. Yes. Um. My name is Nathan Weisler, and um, I'm a recent graduate of Montgomery College, and I now live overseas, and I'm hoping to teach American history 
in schools overseas, and the, and that's something that I really feel very passionately about. Um, I um, I began reading the book, and one thing that struck me in particular was reading about the story of Solomon Northup, and in particular, and in particular about the and in particular about the very emotional details of his homecoming. Um, and um, what I was wondering is. What I was wondering is, what I was wondering is, um, in the course of your research, what did you think, what did you think was, what did you believe to be um, among the most striking parallels and contrasts between the story of Solomon Northup and that of Anna and uh, of Anna and Louisa, of Anna and Louisa. Okay, it's a good question. Of course, for those who, Solomon Northrop being, those of you who saw 12 Years a Slave, who was a free black man in the North, he was kidnapped, sold back into slavery, and of course the southern states had immunized themselves from, from, from having to pay compensation for people who were wrongly re-enslaved. Right. So. And um, his, his story is very instructive. Um, because, um, as I mentioned, one of the challenges when you're writing about enslaved people is, um, is, is, the, is the material, frankly. It's like really, really hard to find the material. Um, in, you know, enslaved people were, um, by law and by practice, barred from learning to read and write. So the kinds of things you would rely on, uh, letters, journals, and that kind of thing are not there. So you're looking for um, those records um, that I mentioned. Um, and you're also looking for contemporaneous voices of people at the time um, who can illuminate something for you. Solomon Northup was someone who was shipped to Louisiana and, and wrote very vividly about a lot of things, about what New Orleans was like, about um, what the plantation life was like, um, and that was very instructive. He also wrote about um, being reunited um, with his family. And unfortunately, that was not something that happened to the two sisters who were split by the sale. Um, but his his experience was was very helpful, and and you get to hear his voice, which is helpful. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm, my name is Janu. I'm visiting from New York. Um, great talk. I'm wondering. I've also been reading about the other scandal which broke about Catholic Church and whether there is an overlap. That is the uh, thing I've been reading about is the uh, boarding schools, which the Catholics also said. Mm -hmm. said. So was there overlap in terms of the same church organization involved in both of these, or how is that? Work? And I think you're talking about the indigenous. In the yeah. Yeah. In the boarding schools. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, because I would not want my sort of introduction of that subject about oppression leading to oppression and the different views to, for people to think that you know, indigenous people were so beautifully treated because right. we are now seeing <laughs> right. sort right. of the way in which, yeah. you know, the, 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 the operative phrase, phrase was sort of kill the Indian to save the man, mm. but um, the right. just horrendous abuses that people were subjected to physically, emotionally, and all right. uh, spiritually. Um, and all of that is, is coming to light now. Mm -hmm. The truth is I don't have an answer for you. Um, I wish I did. I don't. Okay. Um, but... Um, you know, I can certainly see and ask the same kinds of questions because there are certainly feels like there are parallels there. Well, I could see the parallel being that that people who had the power felt that they had the authority to develop different grades of humanity. You know, you're this level of human and you're this level of human. Mm -hmm. And if you're this level of human, this is what you get. I think that seems to be sort of all of a piece. Um, and, 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 you know, and tearing families apart, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And destroying their culture in the safe yeah. and, and substituting your own because yes. you've determined that it's superior. Others. Thank you. Others who would like to join us, our conversation. Hi. Um, I just wanted to mention to the guy from Politics and Prose that Michelle also was on Nightline for decades. <laughs> <laughs> I was 12, so. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess, I don't even know where to begin here, but, um, you know, selling slaves, I mean, they sold slaves to stay in business, and then the priest molested thousands and thousands of children. 
I have a really hard time with this. Where are you going with this, Marjorie? What? Where are you going with this, Marjorie? Well, I'm just saying that, you know, I mean, it is sort of shocking that people actually stay Catholic once they hear all of this. I mean, even the cardinal who was the cardinal of the District of Columbia is now, he was defrocked, and now he's being, uh, uh, he's been re-indicted and for what he did. And it's like, do these people have no shame? I mean, I, I, it's okay to sell slaves. It's okay to molest kids. Um, I don't know. What is a religion about if this is what you do when you're a religious person? I don't know. I just, you know, I, I was wondering if any of this came into, um, and, and if any of the slaves, you know, I mean, many slaves were uh, impregnated and, and things like that. So did any of this come into your um storyline of you know some of these people were probably descendants of some of the slave owners maybe it was even the priests any of this ever come out so my my book doesn't deal at all with the the sex scandals in the church um you know and there's a lot of work in journalism very important work in journalism that has been done um to expose that and i would say that um what I do is try to show kind of what, um, how slavery fueled the growth of the church, how, what, what the priests did, how they treated people. Um, again, I'm mindful of the fact that it wasn't just the Catholic church, Episcopal church, um, all the Protestant church, Baptist, I mean, it was, this was, this was, Sadly, um, it was uh, what was happening at the time. Um, but, you know, it is an ugly, ugly history. Um, there's no way around it. Um, and the reason why it shocked me was because enslaved people have been left largely out of the story that the Catholic Church traditionally tells about itself. Um, and and that's, that's true. It's also true, though, um, and important to note that, as I mentioned before, that there were priests who raised questions and concerns about this. And it's important because one thing that you often hear when you're talking about slavery or studying slavery is people who say, don't bring your morality to the table here. It's, it's, it was legal, it was the time, so you, know, you can't bring your 21st century judgments um, to it. But the truth is that okay. within the Catholic <laughs> Church at the time, there were priests who were raising questions. There were priests who were protesting. There were priests who, um, you know, one of the priests I write about in, um, in the book is a guy by the name of Joseph Carberry who ran a plantation uh, where this Mahoney family was enslaved. And when he learned that this sale was coming, um, he objected. Um, and when he was overruled, when the traders came, he encouraged members of the family to run. Now, what's complicated about that, you know, I think, oh gosh, Joseph Carberry, awesome. Um, but some of the Mahoney's ran, I mentioned the two sisters, Louisa and Anna. Louisa runs with her mother, she hides in the woods. The ships leave, take her sister and an, another sister away, other family members away. Um, and then Louisa and her mother return to the plantation where they are welcomed back by Joseph Carberry into slavery where they remain. Um, Louisa remains, she's one of the last people um, in the records owned by, enslaved by the Jesuits. So it was a complicated um, situation. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, or it's, it just wasn't within the purview of the reporting that I did, I didn't deal with the sexual scandals. Did they ever apologize? Yes. Okay. And who else would like to join our conversation? Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Kyla Matthews, and I'm the fourth great-granddaughter of Louisa Mahoney. Um, I'm also a rising 2L at Georgetown Law right now. Um, and um, in, from what I've experienced, I, I would say that the university is um, more responsive, or they tend to be more reactive than proactive in their uh, accountability efforts and are especially motivated by uh, press and media. So I'm wondering from the point of view of a journalist what you think the most effective way to kind of keep, like, 
preserve this narrative and keep um, attention on this story would be just with like you know our collective attention spans the way it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's a good question, and just in case some of you don't know. Um, so in 2016, one of the things that Georgetown did was um, offer what is in effect legacy status, um, preface, preference in admissions to descendants um, uh, who were interested in going to Georgetown, um, changed the names of the building as, as you know, created an institute um, which is now coming um, online, and then um, created a fund, um, students actually, protested and said, hey, you know, Georgetown, you need to do more for these descendants. Um, and they had a referendum and said, you know, we will tax ourselves in effect. We will institute a fee um, to raise money um, for, for descendants because they felt that the university should do more. The university said, no, 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 we're not gonna do that, but we're gonna raise $400,000 a year um, for programs um, that benefit descendants. Um, that uh, was that program just got underway this year, um, and two hundred thousand dollars has been distributed. The Jesuits, for their part, and, and the Georgetown and the Jesuits both apologized. The jo uh, Jesuits partnered with a group of descendants um, and promised to raise a hundred million dollars to benefit racial reconciliation programs and programs for descendants. Um, that would be the largest effort made by the Roman Catholic Church um, in America to address this history. Um, it has um, had a slow start. They have not raised as much money as um, they had hoped. And as, um, you know, as you might imagine, um, descendants are, um, you know, have mixed feelings about all of these things and um, are asking, you know, could more be done? You know, how should this look? They have their own ideas about how this should look. Um, so the question you ask is kind of how to kind of keep them focused <laughs> on on what needs to happen. Um, you know, I'm a journalist, so you know, I'm not in the advocacy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not. Lane. Yeah, <laughs> that's not what I do. Um, but I certainly can say from ex from experience and just in the story. Um, you know, pressure from students um, in, in raising attention to um, issues involving descendants has certainly drawn media attention. Um, and, you know, in covering institutions, and we've done a lot of that, you know, that sometimes can be helpful. I, I would say that, you know, people, Georgetown has been um, criticized on all sides by um, descendants by uh, people who think they need to do more by alums who are like, "What are you doing? And where why, where are you going with this?" Um, what is certainly true is that Georgetown and the Jesuits have have been, you know, right in the thick of what is now a growing movement um, among institutions and municipalities around the country to acknowledge and try to grapple with this history. We're talking about places like Evanston and you know the state of California. So this is all happening here, and you know, I never thought I would see it. Um, and the question you're asking is, you know, how do we make them do more? <laughs> um, I think part of that is what what you guys have done as descendants, which was w when my first story ran, only the Georgetown Memory Project, uh, Richard Cellini's independent nonprofit, had identified a handful of descendants. Um, you know, there are now um, known at least 6,000 um, descendants. And, and when people found out this history, um, and you can imagine kind of what it might be like to find out <laughs> this kind of history that your ancestors were sold to save this institution, people, um, I like to say people uh, wept, people raged, and then they organized. And I think that organization and that pressure has you know had an impact? Let me ask you this though, because we've we've had two questions now about thank you mm -hmm. for the, about you know history, the teaching of history, and what role that history should play in our current moment. You know, your book arrives at a moment of intense backlash. That's about right. The even teaching history. That's right. This kind of history That's in right. institutions, not just you know in colleges and in people are being you know fired. That's for, right. You know, showing. Um, classic works, 
Um, I you, think you've the talked about truth the fact is, that you started this work. You know, your book, your your initial article landed before some of the work that has become so sort of polarizing, like the 1619 Project, for whatever reason, fair or unfair, sort of the critiques about it. But your book now lands in a moment where literally people are getting works thrown out of the classroom because one person complains, because one person doesn't like it. I'm just interested in your take on that. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know that history is a battleground right now, and particularly um, history involving race and history involving, um, you know, the teaching of, about race and slavery. And for me, even when I first wrote that first article in 2016, this kind of work felt urgent it feels even more urgent to me now. Did it feel dangerous, though? No. I mean, there are, I have, there are colleagues of no. yours who no longer allow their addresses to be known. I've done interviews with them where they won't let us know what city they're in because of right. the fear of the threats to their families and children. That is a fact. Right. So right. I'm just curious if, right. so if that feels, if it feels similarly fraught presenting this work. I mean, this is a very, the people, you've come here voluntarily. You, you are clearly very interested and open and receptive to you know, what Rachel has to say and the work that she has done, I guarantee you it would, might not be the same in other places. And right. so. Yeah, I think, I think we, as journalists, I think we all are uh, more mindful um, than uh, we might have been uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, certainly, I should say that members of my family have, have thought about it, you know, and worried a bit about it um, in terms of, uh, you know, where this lands and um, how people respond. Um, but as I said, you know, to me, um, it, it feels it feels urgent, and you know, I can't shy away from from doing the work. But I'm also realistic and and mindful and careful. Sir, hi, my name is Fred, and uh, Wednesday I was driving to the grocery store, and I decided to turn on Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and you were on, <laughs> and uh, I was feeling great. It was a wonderful day. And um, 15 minutes or less, I really got into the story. And 30 minutes or less, I started getting angry. 45 minutes or less, I was furious. <laughs> 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 so um, to piggy piggyback on some of the comments, um, if 45 minutes or less, I got that angry, how do you do your research without gritting your teeth along the way? And with the universities that's widespread who benefited from slavery, with affirmative action decision coming down soon, right. how do the universities are compelled, since race is the focal point, with the decision, if it comes down against affirmative action, how do you, does that handcuff the universities with this legacy issue in, that you've exposed. Is, is, is this all of a sudden a different kind of issue that they're going to have to deal, not the courts, but the schools? Will they be handcuffed now because of a decision when now we have legitimate reasons why this legitimacy of us? But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Right. You've got two questions there. One is about how do you, um, how do, you do this work? And um, as I mentioned, um, it's, not, it's not easy work to do. Um, there are times, um, you know, where, um, you know, I come across a document, I, I read something, and I just, I just have to just, I just stop. I have to take a breath, close my eyes, take another breath, and um, I keep going because we need to know. If, if I don't look, and if I look away, then, you know, I, I think this work needs to be done. Um, so, um, you I know, so I keep when reading. Up, when you get up the next morning, is it difficult to approach knowing what you're getting ready to get into? You know, so here's the thing, is, you're right. It's uh, it is heartbreaking. It's it's terrifying. I mean, uh, well, some well, sometimes what I what I do, I, I think uh, again as a journalist to be able to tell the story, I need to kind of put myself there. So I I've had conversations with my son um, 
uh, who's a teenager. And you know, I think about those sisters, Louisa and Anna, and the priest telling them, you've got to run. Anna had two children, young children. They had elderly parents. What do you do? Do you run? What do you do? Um, you know, I, I, you know, those things weigh on me, right. you know. Um, but, but the thing that's important to know, though, too, is that this is a story of heartbreak for sure. But it is also a story of resistance and struggle. It's also a story of family and faith. And remember that I came to this as someone, a Catholic woman, who had never heard that Catholic priests enslaved anybody. I, I had never heard anything. I did not know about these people. So I was very motivated and inspired to tell a story that I felt had not been told. Okay. Enslaved people had been left out of this story. And so that is what kept me going. Now, on affirmative action. You, I'm just going to say that we've got about five people oh, who would love to okay. be part of our conversation. I'm going yes. to ask you to, to uh, quick, move it, move bit. it. Yeah, so, you know, bit. I would say affirmative action is uh, colleges. I'm a professor at NYU. Colleges all across the country are bracing for this and readying for it. Um, it's not, you know, part of my purview. Um, but you're right that a lot of institutions are going to be trying to figure out what to do. And I will move it along. Well, I asked Toni Morrison that question once that you, sir, that you just asked. I asked her, you know, because some of her books are so deeply disturbing and so the details. And I said, is it hard for you to write these stories? She said, not as hard as it was to live them. Right. Right. <laughs> Hi, how, how is everyone this evening? My name is Julie Hawkins Ennis. I am from Southern Maryland. My mom was from uh, St. Mary's. My dad was from Charles. I grew up strictly Catholic where I came from in Southern Maryland, like she said earlier, uh, where we're from, that was the seat of Catholicism. I didn't know any other religion until I left St. Mary's County to go to college because everybody I grew up with was Catholic. Catholic Catholicism wasn't, uh, wasn't a, a religion for us. It was our way of life. So I didn't hear about this story until about 2015. Um, I was on Ancestry. And our history was we're from here. We were from Southern Maryland, nowhere else. I kept connecting to someone down in Louisiana and Alabama, and we went back and forth about, well, I know you're from the Deep South, yada, yada, yada. Make this story short, because I'm long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> about 2016, I started hearing about the GU-272. Also, my son was at Gonzaga uh, College High School in um, Washington, D.C. Which also benefited from Right, which also benefited. Well, the students there, because of this story, started doing their own research of the, the people at Gonzaga. My son comes home and says, Mom, they're talking about your home, St. Mary's County, and the priest, as he said, <laughs> sold people from Southern Maryland. My grandmother had just died. We came from a family where, I mean, I had friends that would come down, white friends that thought we were part Italian because my grandmother would be saying the rosary every day. That's all we knew. I mean, seriously, every day. Novena, if you needed something, she knew every saint to call to get you, you know, if you lost something, all of that. You know, and all you Catholics know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so when, and, and Richard Cellini is a friend of mine. I started talking to Richard, and he started filling me in along with other GU272. But here's the thing from pe for me, being from Southern Maryland. I'm not a part of the families that were sold, but we are the part of the families who lost family. Right. And we want to find them. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and do my little stint now. But we're doing, I got money from Georgetown, me and a team to do the, a gathering in Southern Maryland over Labor Day weekend. So anybody that would like to come who is a descendant, we would welcome you. Because the Maryland side, we're still trying to figure out who are the people we lost. But in my family, we have Eatlands, I have Barnes. She knows these are the surnames. I'm a Hawkins, uh, we have Dorsey, we have uh, Mason. And we're still in Maryland. But let me tell you this, when I found this out, I was so glad, my, my grandmother had just uh, passed. I was so glad because she would have been devastated. We looked up. I mean, Catholic say it was our way of life. When I found out, I was, like someone just said, I cried, I became angry, and I even thought about leaving the Catholic Church. I'm, I'm Catholic to this day, my entire family. Had to think through it, talk myself through it. But this is what I want to know, and just like she just said, I grew up five miles from Newtown Manor, about 10 miles from St. Inigo's. My grandmother's Barnes family was from St. Inigo's. Those Inigo's. are the plantations. These are the plantations. We never heard this story at all. I went to Catholic school. 
everybody, I had priests and nuns, and then I, I came from a community that was very, um, you know, they honored their black history, they honored, we never heard this story. I never heard of it, yeah. never. We never heard it from the priests, we never heard it from the Jesuits, which I guess, you know, now that I think about it, they wouldn't want you to know. We never heard about it. I was even wondering, you know, like with my grandmother, I was wondering if it was so much trauma and people were hiding that they just didn't talk about it. And as generations went on, it just went away. Because I'm from Southern Maryland. I'm from all these yeah. areas where the plantations were. Yeah. Well, so, I feel like there's a yeah. book in you, and you might consider. Now, everybody keeps telling me that. <laughs> well, when Raquel, the would you like that? <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Did you have a specific question for Rachel? You just I, wanted to share I, I, that. I just wanted to share yeah. that. But yeah. I did have the question, do you think it was trauma that we did not know about, so about some, this at all? So I think sometimes um, it was, you know, there's some some families where um, people have told me they thought their elders deliberately didn't tell them. Yeah. Um, I will say this. I don't mean to cut you off. My grandfather used to tell me, and his family actually grew up at Newtown Manor, but they were free people of color. Right. But he used to tell me that his great-grandmother would always say, you know, they sold some of us down the river. Right. And yeah. I had no idea what that was until right. this happened, and I think he was talking about the GU-272. Right. Thank you for right. sharing that. Yeah. yeah. And can we have you join us? Yeah. Hi, I'm Lorraine Carter. My question is quick. <laughs> <laughs> i like to know, because you are a journalist, and you say because you're a journalist, you, you kind of direct your, your uh, information as far as being a journalist. What I wanted to know, once you started this book, once this book was exposed, what kind of dialogue did you have with the dia the, uh, dias the, the, the yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And the interaction you had, because now you have this exposure, and everyone, particularly, in America, no, this is a hidden story that is not being told. So you are telling the story. So I'm wanting to know as far as. Have I had like backlash or? No, with oh. your position. Okay. And even though you say you're a journalist, what is your position to bring, to bring it further for more accountability for the Catholic Church? It, just like Georgetown has an endowment, and I understand giving out uh, scholarships or whatever this right. is not compared to what has happened to the people right. in Merlin so I'm right. wondering because you have the more the mm -hmm. direct mm -hmm. uh, yeah. line to be having a dialogue with them have you had that and what if you have had it mm -hmm. what was the outcome or what is being actually done just right. not what they're giving to the people that right. were enslaved because America, most of us, our people were enslaved. Right. This is just one component. portion. Yeah. So, you know, again, I am a journalist, <clears throat> so I don't get involved with, you know, directing policy or even advocating for things. What, what I am very involved in and care about and what my next um, stage of my work is trying to create, um, I'm working on creating a digital archive that would, um, it's not just universities, it's not just the Catholic Church, it's other religious organizations, it's banks, it's insurance companies. I want to create a digital archive where the data sets of those records are available so that journalists, scholars, community members, families can see them and then take the steps that they want to take that communities want to take, uh, advocates want to take, but it's not I, it's not my role as a journalist. Right, yeah. and, and, you're, and also, so what you're saying, that there was no actual direct in, interaction with the, the I, diocese, with, you know, diocese. Yeah, I don't, not, certainly not in terms of, no one's asking me, um, you know, no one from the Catholic Church is asking me, or Georgetown, hey, Rachel Swarns, what should we do, or, like, it's it's just not the role that I play. It's not. Okay, yeah. so you just wrote the book, so it's, it's exposure for people that do want to take it further. That's right. Okay, thank you. Know, you. There's a similar project that's very interesting in the United Kingdom where the people who, whose vast fortunes, including members of the royal family, were built on enslavement, particularly in the islands. And yeah. it's very interesting to see these folks reckon with, in fact, there was a journalist who actually left the BBC when she realized that. You know oh, that's so about? interesting, yeah. Once she realized that, you know, her family had been enslavers, 
and she wanted to dig into it further. She she couldn't do both, so mm. she has now decided, decided that, that, to, that that is going to be her, her focus. Her focus. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Just pull it down. Yeah, yeah, oh, no. oh, I'm sorry. Just talk. No, no, no. Just, talk. Just, just talk. Okay. Just talk. Just talk. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, uh, Rachel, I want to publicly acknowledge you and thank you. We talked back in, of course, May of 2016 after the article with uh, the breaking big mm -hmm. article with Cousin Maxine Crump. Oh, by the way, my name is Rochelle Prater. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to thank you because I, I – I, I know the title of that article was A Million Questions, which I had at the time, and thank God a lot of them have been uh, answered, but the point that I wanted to make clear that I said something to you in that article that I felt like I had won the lottery. And for those people who may look at that article and read that article, I want to share, it's emotional because my family was some of the family that was taken to Louisiana. And how I won the lottery, I'd had so much loss in my life, family loss, that's gone, that would have loved to have known this history and understood it. But now, I have cousin Julie, I have cousin Peggy, I have cousin Jeremy, I have cousin Kevin Porter. One of the things that has happened is that families have now found each other. These families that were split by the sale have found each other. So, so that's what your efforts, that is the return on that story breaking, is that we are reuniting. And this is stellar in the African American community. This typically doesn't happen. And it continues to happen every day. And just like Julie said, our hearts be that one on that goal. We're going to find as many as we can, and we're going to come together as many as we can. And for the lady that was before us, that's how we impact how to deal with this history, not only you know on a national and a world level. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Mm -hmm. And I think this will be our final uh, uh, you. Yes, hello. Oh, and then <laughs> after you, you're, Rachel, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'd like you to kind of give us a cl concluding thought after this lady shares her, her thoughts with us. Just give us something to take home. I just want to thank you, and I'm really looking forward to your archive of um, records. Um, my family name also includes the name Kemp, and given, but I, we're from Virginia, and given the exchange and trafficking of people in the Delmarva Peninsula, I, I know that more records will be useful to me, too, because that research is hard to do. And I also wanted to push back gently <laughs> on this concept that it was oppression that bred oppression, given the papal bulls that came down mm -hmm. centuries be before in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. that basically said, enslaved to build the new world. Mm -hmm. I just want to know what you, you think of that. And, no, if you could just expand on that. When you say that... Um, the papal bulls? Yes. Mm -hmm. These were papal No, decrees. I know what the oh, bulls okay. are. But, yeah. Well, you said earlier that um, that the priests somewhat, you know, they had to enslave people because they couldn't enslave Native people anymore. No, no. Well, first of all, no. let me just yeah. say that okay. that, was the, that was not Rachel's phrasing. That was mine. One okay. of the things I was saying is that what was interesting to me that I learned from the book was that how... Well, I mean, don't we see this in the world today? You know, you are angry and afraid, so you then oppress somebody else because you're angry and afraid, and it's a sort of... Well, I mean, given it was law, I'm just wondering, because the papal bulls were law, and <laughs> once those came down, it just became the mode of operation versus it being because you were oppressed in Europe. I just think, you know, I'm just pushing back on that, wondering your comments in response to that. Yeah, I, and just so that I'm clear, the you're talking about when I said what that when they came and 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 were seeing themselves as persecuted, um, and feeling like they wanted to join, uh, the you know, nice society that be part of society that was kind of pushing them away, that kind of thing. Yeah. That so mm -hmm. they they I mean they did talk about that you know they did talk about you know wanting to be. Um, the truth is, of course, that it was the economy and that they were also, you're absolutely right, very explicit about mm -hmm. 
what their intentions were and why they were doing this, um, both in terms of Rome, in terms of you know enslaving people, uh, you know, is part of conquest and a, mm -hmm. and about you know uh, about money and and with this sale even um, the priest who was pushing the hardest for it had a vision of building schools in the Northeast, and he was very, very, very clear that in order to do that, he would need money, and the Jesuits would need money to do it, and, and this was the way that they were going to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So Rachel, thank you for spending this evening with us. Thank all of you for being here and uh, spending this time with us. And I understand you're gonna sell sign, sign. Sign. <laughs> So books, but I just was wondering if I could just ask you to kind of leave us with a concluding thought. I mean, there's so much here. There's so much. It's just, as you said, it's a story of heartbreak. It's a story of love. It's a story of resistance. It's a story of reunion. It's a story of, of family and coming. Families broken apart by violence. Families brought together through love and persistence. And I just, yeah, I was wondering about that. Thanks. But I... And you said that so nicely yourself. <laughs> but I, I just wanted yeah. to ask if you would just kind of give us a concluding thought. Like when you, when you put your, you close your laptop at night and when you thought about what this project has meant to you and to the families, what, what is it that comes to mind? What, what do you, what do you, when you, you're going to go on to another project at some point, but I'm just saying what, what has this meant to you? Um, I think it's important um, uh, for, um, uh, these folks and, and these folks who are long gone to be seen and, and to be recognized and to be acknowledged. And I think that it's important for us um, as Americans to understand that um, this is our history. Um, I think the work that I do, um, I'm different from a historian in that, you know, I'm, I'm very engaged with the past. But I'm engaged with the past because I'm really interested in how we live with this history and what we do with it. And so um, I think what matters to me is, um, again, that we are, we are mindful of it, um, that we interrogate history, that we don't just, you know, we're, we're, journalists are accustomed to this, right? If, there's, if the CEO is, is handing you a financial record, you're, you're asking questions, ask questions about um, the history that you've been taught. Why is it that you don't know things? And, and I think just recognizing um, uh, these folks and, and having them seen is really important. Rachel Swarns, um, descendants, all of you, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you.